Hi y'all. So in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the resignations that have happened recently and the way that bureaucracies work. So a lot of people on the left are making a, a big to-do about the fact that a lot of Foreign Service employees have resigned and how this imperils the Republic and now we're, you know, we're a minute closer to nuclear war because these career uh, diplomats, career service people have worked a long time, they've gotten to the top, they bring with them a lot of talent and expertise, which is not easy to get. That is true. But of course, um, these services work on an up and out kind of uh, system. You must progress or you must go away. That's good at the top leadership, it's not so good at the, at the ground level. So if you think uh, in terms of a military, you don't want stagnant generals, you don't want people who are fighting the last war, people who have a lot of experience in fighting something that's no longer a relevant consideration on a modern battlefield. You want the new guy who understands the new landscape and how to deal with that. And one way that you fold into the organization a system whereby you don't get stuck with people who are really good at, at doing things that are no longer useful is forced retirement. You either progress or you go away. You either, uh, and they do set time limits on like how the maximum amount of time you can serve, uh, ages and whatnot. And then, of course, you want to empower, say, the president to be able to make exceptions because occasionally you get people who uh, do bring with them that tremendous amount of ex expertise and experience, but who have not become inflexible, who learn new things, who understand the new battlefield. In other words, you get like a really creative genius who you want to keep around uh, forever and ever because they keep adapting to new situations. They're not stuck in the past, so the president can make waivers to this, but the general rule is up and out. Now, in, with the career diplomats who have resigned and whatnot, the, um, they work on the same principle that the army uses, which is it's the job of a person to know the, the job of the person two ranks above them and one rank below, two billets above them and one billet below them. It is, of course, hard to build in that kind of expertise. You can't just go out uh, on the street and get people for these jobs, which is precisely why uh, all these senior people have junior people who work under them and who have watched them over the years and who have learned from them and who are prepared to take their spots when they go away. So if you do have a thinning of the herd uh, at the change of an administration, it doesn't actually cripple the organization because there are people there who are younger but nevertheless have sufficient experience, sufficient knowledge, sufficient expertise, and less baggage, incidentally to be able to still do the, the core mission of the organization, whatever it happens to be, but aren't living in the past and aren't going to be, hopefully, as hostile to the legal orders of the new administration. Now, even our governmental structure is set up to account of, of uh, these facets of human nature, the kind of um, idea that, uh, prominently said by Henry Ford and of the Ford Motor Company, that what's good for Ford is good for America, the view that I know what's right for everyone else, now it's just for everyone else to get on board and understand how great and wonderful I am. Well, okay. So, on the front end, is, which is the, polit the political branches, that's, those are the in uh, instruments of change. Those are the engines of, of progress or traditionalism or conservatism. Whatever it is that the people want, uh, you know, from one year to the next, that's the political branch. And uh, they are very responsive to change. And indeed, you have the Senate, which is supposed to be the, legislat the legislative version of a retarding force. And then the House of Representatives, which is supposed to be the impetus to change frequently because they are the ones most connected to the people. They change, they uh, turn over much more quickly. So, but that's the political se uh, section of the government. Then at the Supreme Court, you have people who you want to be traditionalists, who you want to be conservative. And the reason for it is, is, is that there is a reason that laws are written. Laws are written not to effectuate rapid change in society. Laws are written to restrain actions, to rigidify a certain state of affairs. That's why the Constitution is there and it's so hard to change. It is to rigidify these uh, things which are written therein. And you want judges on the back end who really do sit around with their feet and you, la, 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 we're not changing, we're not changing. So that way, uh, if and when change comes, it happens slowly and it's not just some knee-jerk reaction. The framers of our Constitution, the founders of this country, were not idiots. They understood um, the nature of man and how uh, the psychology of how people work actually operates. And by psychology here, I don't mean as a science. I mean, they, they were able to look around and notice how people behave, what the outcomes were 
at various uh, points along the way. So you have uh, someone like um, Yates, who was a career prosecutor. She you know, worked her way up, and then she gets into a position of some authority and decides that, well, I don't agree with the new administration, and therefore I'm going to resist the new administration, and I'm going to, by hook or by crook, find a way to pretend as though my personal policy preferences are, in fact, uh, what, what are the outer bounds of proper legal conduct. Uh, you go look at the Park Service, where uh, an employee or former employee hijacked their Twitter account, started tweeting things, and there was a social media ban from the administration, and how this is, was portrayed by some people as being uh, invalid conduct on behalf of the administration because it's their right to protest. No, it isn't. When you take a job for the government, you forfeit certain liberties that you would have as a freestanding private citizen. One of which is that it is your job to faithfully and uh, promptly obey the orders, the lawful orders, of those who are above you, whether you agree with them or disagree with them. I've covered this in two previous videos recently, but if you disagree with them to that extent, resign and go protest all you want, or protest on your own time. These are people who are using government resources, uh, you know, the government's Twitter account, to attack the policies of the new administration. In other words, these are people whose side lost the election, and they want to pretend as though they are the ones who should still be in charge. I'm all for um, cleaning out this, this problem when a new administration comes into office. Uh, if you're not on, on board with being able to impartially execute the lawful orders of the administration, you gotta go. It's just that simple. Uh, one tweet um, to me was actually kind of funny. It says, for every one of these resistance tweets from the Park Service, uh, their budget should, should be reduced by a million dollars. And let's see how they like that. Now, on the Park Service people, you had the problem with their uh, unlawfully hijacking the Twitter account in the first place and then forming this group in the second place. I don't have a problem with the group in the second place uh, as a general proposition, but I was reading some of their tweets, and some of it is just scientific data, which, fine, whatever. But one of them was a call for CIA officials to go rogue against the United States president. And that is, you talk about how dangerous Trump supposedly is. This is dangerous kind of talk. If you think about the way the CIA has historically gone after heads of state or heads of government with which they've disagreed, it's in uh, trying to get revolutions, rebellions, or outright assassinations. This is not the kind of... Now, the, the people who are doing this, who are engaging in this rhetoric, are scientists. They're not idiots. They're not uppity high school students. They're well-educated. Um, they have to know how the CIA operates, particularly given how these people are generally very much against government action because, you know, we're liberals and people should be free to do what I want them to be able to do, but not what they want to do, but what I want them to be able to do. And they don't like it when the, uh, these clandestine organizations engage in activities abroad because it's oppressing the poor brown peoples of the world. Um, th so they can protest that, but here it's a different matter, and they want to engage officials of the United States government to go rogue against the United States government in some unspecified way. But who do they, who do they ask to go rogue? The CIA, the organization that has a history of killing people or fomenting rebellions or invasions and these types of things. Now on to the more issues uh, related to the CIA and Trump having recently removed um, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the DNI from the National Security Council as a matter of uh, normal membership. Now this too supposedly has imperiled the country. Who was it, I wonder? Who was advising the President? I, I think quietly to myself about going into Iraq. Was, wasn't that the intelligence officials in the military doing that? Yes, I think that it was. One of the greatest things that JFK ever did was ignore the generals in the Cuban Missile Crisis and not take their advice for precipitous action. Um, <clears throat> the vested interests of many of the officials in these, different in these different branches is not that of um, what a president has to think about. They are focused on their, which probably they should be focused on their role. If you're a military strategist, you need to be looking at military solutions. 
you're an intelligent strategist, you should be looking at other kinds of things. If you're a diplomat, you should be looking at diplomatic solutions. So everyone's watching their lane. The problem is, <clears throat> the president can't sit there and pretend as though he his only job is to look at the military options. It is the job of a president to say no to his advisors uh, and to resist their very vociferous uh, urgings to do certain kinds of things which are going to actually wind up being imprudent. Because their job is to not worry about the overall prudence of the president's decision, is to give <clears throat> the president their view about uh, how they can best execute uh, some order that he's going to give them. They should you know, try to persuade him to give a, a given kind of order. But the problem is, you have a lot of presidents who are too weak and stupid to realize it's their job to say no very often. <clears throat> now, as people progress up the chain, they do learn, they learn hopefully they learn a lot. Uh, and, you know, watching you know, the two up, one down rule for billeting. Uh, so they'll bring with them expertise and experience, but they also bring baggage. And there's a reason we have the adage that you can't teach a new, uh, an old dog new tricks. People become intransigent and flexible and set in their ways, and they become very difficult to work with. And that is precisely why uh, we don't have a king. We have elections that where the government is routinely turned over. It's to keep it from becoming old and inflexible and intransigent and saying, well, this is the way things have always been, and therefore this is the way things always should be, or what is good for me as king is good for the country. Because, as I mentioned in my last video, um, the confusion that people uh, get along the way where they start to, to think of themselves as being identical with the office that they hold, and that it, there's not a division there. It's not that they're exercising some office that's external to them, to which they have responsibilities. It's that these can, things kind of just mesh together and meld, and suddenly whatever I think is what the office thinks, and therefore that's the way that things should be. So you, you always have this careful balancing act. And the framers of our Constitution, the founders of our country, did a good job in making sure that you had the engines of change you know, taken care of, with the House of Representatives being most responsive, the Senate being less responsive, but more for states' rights at the time, although that was done away with by an amendment, and a president who is routinely, uh, where there's a routine vacancy, but also making sure that people don't get caught up in some kind of zeitgeist and, do, uh, and become cacoethetic, which means the, the irresistible urge to do something that's inadvisable. And that's where the court system is. That is a retarding force. That's what they're there to do is to say no to the government very often. Yes, we realize that you want to do this. We realize that it's popular. We realize that uh, the people really want this. But there's just this one niggling little problem. It's not lawful. If the people really want to do this, they're, they're going to have to spend a long period of time persuading 75% of the legislatures in the states or ratifying conventions to trim some fat off of the Constitution which even when people do want change, that is not something that we do quickly. Even with, when people really, really, really want something because uh, people just intuitively get that the moment you start excising privileges or rights that people have previously had that you don't like, uh, you're going to learn very quickly that as a matter of retaliation, the rights that you cherish are going to be stripped out by uh, the self-same means. And if you make it easy to do it uh, to the people Who's, you know, whose issues you don't care about, uh, you better believe that, j maybe just even out of spite, they will find a way to uh, return the favor um, many times over. They'll come back for their pound of flesh. So we do leave that alone. Uh, we do not go stripping rights out of the Constitution. Our history has been, our tradition has been one of adding things to it, not taking things away from it. We, we took something away once in Prohibition, and uh, that little experiment did not last long. They quickly realized the folly of their thinking and they uh, wisely reversed that. So anyway, um, you have to take account of both um, the, the expertise, the talent, the knowledge that people have, but also the baggage. In other words, uh, Bill Clinton said this, uh, at, uh, I, I don't remember if it was his library dedication. Anyway, it was some library dedication. Uh, and he said, progressivism at its best is about changing things that should never have been the case. And conservatism at its best is about making sure we don't, that we, we always cherish the things that properly should be a focus of our affections, that properly should be a sincere um, thing that all people should want to protect, like the sanctity of 
families, you know, these kinds of things. And, you know, there's some force to that. Uh, progress progressivism could be done well, could be done intellectually, honestly, and appropriately. It's not the way that it's gone, but it could be done that way. There are things that have happened in the past that are bad. They need to be changed. But so, too, are there things that have happened in the past that are excellent, exquisite. They're, they're perfect. Leave them the hell alone. And striking that balance is never going to be perfect. It's never going to be easy. It's always going to be difficult. But you do have to take account of the fact that, that you want traditions that are good to be uh, maintained, and you want immoral practices, unethical practices, illegal practices to go away. And so that requires engines of change when we learn from our past mistakes to stop doing those mistakes. But not, uh, it does not require and it should not countenance the idea that we should be so open-minded to change that we forget that there is such a thing as things that have worked in the past and still continue to work where um, you're not constantly doing change just for the sake of doing change, just because you can. You have to resent, re, uh, resent, <laughs> resist uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Imp of the Perverse, the doing of a thing simply because you know that you shouldn't or simply because you know that you can do it. So you've, you've got to bake all of that into one system, and I think we've done a reasonably good job. Not perfect. It'll never be perfect. Uh, but unfortunately, you do have um, an element in our society that wants change just for its own sake, that... Uh, and then you have another group of people who don't want change just for the sake of the fact that, well, X has always been done, and I'm comfortable with X, and it's always having been done, therefore that is the right way to do it. And you've, you've got to have a meeting of the minds on that, and one side of the discussion is making that incredibly difficult at the time, because uh, it doesn't matter what you bring up, it's all bad. The, the, uh, a good joke that I like, I don't know if anybody else has told it, but I'm sure I'm not the first person to have observed this, today's progressive, today's radical, is tomorrow's conservative. Because conservatism, after all, is about making sure that what was done in, in the past of the people who are the then conservatives uh, continues to be done. And so if you are a successful political activist, you will get enacted into law the things that you like. And then, lo and behold, you're going to try to protect those. And you become uh, the, the next generation's conservative, saying, oh, no, no, no. Listen to feminists about uh, abortion rights and how... It's a long-standing tradition in the country now that we have abortion rights. That is, that is the voice of conservatism. Now, older conservatives and people who disagree with it uh, remember a time before there were abortion rights, and so they want to be slightly more conservative by going further back in time. But it is the same kind of speech. It is an implicit recognition that there are things that happen in the world which one will think are good and should persist, and will defend those. And, uh, and they happen in the past, they were handed down to you, you like them, and you want to preserve them. That's conservatism. And then uh, the losing side of those wars become tomorrow's progressives, or tomorrow's uh, engines, instruments of change, saying, oh no, yes, well, now I understand that, that uh, on, on one view of conservatism, abortion rights are a conservative issue for feminists, but I want to be a progressive and change it to bring justice to the unborn. That's how they could phrase it, but, you know, they won't. I, another thing that I said about, just on abortion, is if, if the Christian right suddenly started referring to fetuses as either vaginal or womb refugees, you would watch feminists trip over themselves to, to uh, let them in. Save the fetus! <laughs> this discrimination against a refugee! Let them in! I know it's a joke, but it cracked me up. Alright, I think I'll leave it there. Have a great day.